Hello, uh, good morning, afternoon or evening. Uh, welcome to this Action Indonesia Global Species Management Plan webinar. And I am Lee Zimmerman, and I work at the AANTA Executive Office of the European Association uh, of Zoos and Aquaria as an animal program and conservation coordinator will be the host of this webinar. And this webinar today will focus on giving you an insight into the various aspects of conserving genetic diversity within the populations of the Action Indonesia Global Species Management Plans, or GSMPs, for Bantang, Babi Rusa, Anoa, and Sumatran tiger, and why it is so important for their survival. Uh, to do this, we have uh, we are joined by six representatives from the international collaborative team who are working on these uh, global species management plans, and they will be sharing how their expertise uh, contributes to the so-called one plan approach conservation efforts for these uh, for Indonesian species. Um, as you can see on the slide here. Um, the knowledgeable representatives of the Action Indonesia team here today are Dr. James Burton, who is the chair of the ICN Sisi Asian Wild Cattle Specialist Group and convener of the Anoa, Banteng, and Babarusa GSMPs. We also have Dr. Ligaya Tumbalaka here, who is the head of the Education and Training Division at the Indonesian Zoo Association, EKBSI. Uh, she's also the Sumatran Tiger GSMP co-convener, co-leader of the Education Working Group, as well as the Indonesian Sumatran Tiger Subgroup. We have Christina Wilson joining, who is the population biologist at Copenhagen Zoo in Denmark, and she's the leader of the Genetics Working Group. Action Indonesia team, we have John Andrews, who is Assistant Director at the Avalay Population Management Center at Lincoln Park Zoo in the United States and Population Management Advisor for Noah Stuck Group. We have Amy Humphreys, Curatorial Assistant from Chester Zoo in the UK, and she's the European Bunting Stuck Group Keeper and the leader of the Hutchinson Training group, Working Group. And finally, we also have Julia Klum, who is the Graphic Designer at Zoo Miami at, in the US, and she's the member of the Education Working Group of this team. So, in around two weeks' time, there's actually uh, the fifth International Action Indonesia Celebration Day. And um, you will hear a little bit more about, about it during this course, uh, uh, during the course of this web webinar, I mean, and how you can join that. Um, some practical things. So this webinar is delivered in English, and it will be around one hour. And the session will be recorded and made available afterwards uh, to view, and it will also have Indonesia Bahasa subtitle. So during the webinar, we will be asking our invited speakers uh, some questions that are focused on how and why observing genetic diversity within the population of the action in Indonesia cheese and pea species is important. And there's also an opportunity for you to ask your questions to them. Uh, questions in English and Indonesian are welcome at any time in the chat or in the Q&A part of this platform, and we will try to answer uh, a lot of them uh, during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. So before we move to the panelists and speakers, um, I guess I want to know a little bit more about who is viewing us today or at least where you are viewing at this webinar today. Uh, so we're short prepared. So if that can be long, and then people can identify where they're coming from. And I think it is should be launched now. So feel free to provide an answer. And there's different different time zones to take into account. So people from uh, where it's morning now, I recommend I uh, uh, how do you say I uh, salute you for getting up early to sit. Um, I think we have about 75 of our participants answering right now. Yeah, I think the rest is either shy to answer uh, or doesn't want to share. Um, but I think it's good to uh, show the results. Yes, you can. We, we should be able to see. 
divided. So we have uh, people from Indonesia there, welcome from Europe. So UK and EU, USA, and also some people or one person from the rest of the world, <laughs> which is curious. Well, I would be curious to, to hear who that would be. So if you if you can put that in chat, that would be great. Um, okay, thank you very much. And let me just change my screen for myself a little bit. Okay. So welcome to all, and I hope you uh, enjoy this webinar today, uh, wherever you are. And I want to like to move to the first speaker or ask the first question to the first speaker. Uh, and that would be Dr. James Burton, uh, Chair of the ICN SSC Asian Wild Cattle group and as I said convener of the Angulus GSMPs. Uh, James, can you tell us actually what a global species management plan is and the so-called one plan approach that's taken in these conservation plans? Great. Well hello everybody. Uh, morning, lunchtime, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thanks. It's nice to see where everyone's coming from. Um, so firstly, yeah, just maybe to explain a little bit about my my role in the Action Indonesia GSMP. So I developed the strategic approach, working with a lot of partners to identify um, how we need to save these four lovely, beautiful species, uh, and also work on developing the links and building the bridges between the regions of uh, North America, Europe, and Indonesia. Uh, and with our Sumatra and Tiger colleagues also in Japan and, and Australia to make sure we all have a single approach and uh, vision for how we want to save these species. Um, so what is a global species management plan? Well, it's, it's a partnership. It's a collaboration between uh, zoo regions across the world in order to help uh, zoo staff to share information, to learn from each other, and also to help with the transfer of animals to achieve a truly global uh, international zoo population for these species. For, for many species, uh, a global approach working between different regions is the only way we're going to save these, these populations by, uh, by achieving a large enough uh, population. So global species management plans are a, a really important tool for conservation. Um, and for the Action Indonesia GSMPs, we are lucky to have many partners from Europe, North America, uh, and also Indonesia working together uh, and have been for the last six or seven years. Um, we've been also following the one plant approach to conservation, to species conservation. And this is not just uh, looking to the exit you populations or zoo populations that are backups or insurance for conservation, but also working with in situ partners. So within Indonesia, working with national parks to help monitor and in the future protect um, these species in their, in their natural habitat. And so this all comes into a single plan or a single approach that this team of, of amazing international experts is working on to deliver conservation for these. Issues. And how we do that is through a number of thematic working groups. So, as was mentioned, we have the genetics working group. We also have working groups on population management, help define the breeding approaches that we need, and also in animal husbandry, and of course, in situ conservation as well. So, these thematic working groups are experts from across to help save these species. Uh, and over the last seven years, we've made some really big uh, assesses, uh, as well as implementing uh, breeding programs in Indonesian, Indonesian colleagues there, no. um, which has been happening more and more um, over the last few years. Um, we've also been doing a number of research activities, including on genetics, uh, and a lot of transfer of knowledge and expertise uh, around husbandry, uh, and obviously in in situ monitoring. So conservation of species uh, is, is really, really uh, focused on populations often. So when we think of the status of a species, we think of its population size, uh, and that's how we kind of define the conservation in the zoo or in the wild. But actually genetic diversity 
is really, really essential for the future. So let's hear more about this lesser known, very important uh, part of conservation. Yeah, that means that we have to talk to a geneticist, I would say, if we talk about genetic diversity. So, panelist, which is Christina Hilton from Copenhagen Zoo in Denmark. So, Christine explained, can you briefly explain what genetic diversity is and why it is essential to survival of the species or all these species, actually? I will to try at least. Um, so let me see if I can do the screen sharing. There you go. Um, so as James just mentioned, um, they think about species when they talk, uh, when they think about uh, biodiversity. Um, and if we're talking about biodiversity, we have to talk about the Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, the CBD, which is the most important international agreement to conserve biodiversity by uh, close to 200 uh, nations. Um, biodiversity consists of three levels. Uh, let me see if I can do this. There you go. So you have the which uh, we know what is and can see with our eyes. The same goes for the species of what we think about also when we think about biodiversity. But the third layer, um, which is something that we can't see with our eyes, and it's uh, the third and often level of biodiversity. Um, it's a very important um, level of biodiversity because it's actually the prerequisite for evolution um, and also the long-term survival of both populations but also um, of species. Um, it facilitates the adaptation um, to environment, to climate change, uh, new pests, diseases, um, and can augment species diversity by supporting ecosystem resilience. Um, it also provides resilience after extreme events uh, and allows for species to restore uh, after devastating declines. Um, genetic diversity is at the DNA level, and it can actually be detected both among individuals, as we have here on the slide, uh, but also among populations. And it's what we geneticists uh, define as intraspecific genetic diversity. So it's basically what happens at the DNA level but it's a very important level uh, when we're talking about biodiversity and also to in order to conserve species and their ecosystems. So genetic diversity among populations can reflect genetic adaptations both to local environment and to ecological conditions. If you have high gen genetic diversity, uh, you have high adaptive capacity, you have good potential for long-term survival, and you have high resilience. So that's what we want to have. But unfortunately, a low genetic diversity, which is something that we sometimes see in, in small populations, and as James also mentioned before, um, we're here with the GSMP dealing with species where the population sizes are not as big as, as we would have hoped for. So they're rather small, um, and some of them are actually living in isolated populations. Um, for low genetic diversity populations, uh, you do have low adaptive capacity, you have a weak potential for long-term survival, and you have low resilience. So we, what we're doing with the GSMP is to try to maximize what we can in terms of genetic diversity for the populations uh, of the species wherever they live, ex situ and in situ. So we'll just Thank stop you. sharing. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> so that's the theory behind it. Um, but how uh, you're part of the whole the Action Indonesia uh, team. So how does your role as a geneticist contribute to conserving genetic diversity for these species and these species? So we do what we can. We are a group working group with a lot of experts in it. Um, and my Indonesian counterpart, Dr. Professor Gono Simiadi, who's also joining us today, we're leading on the, the team that works on the genetics of these uh, species. 
So what we're doing is that we are uh, collecting samples and we are analyzing them using genetic tools. Um, for the ex situ populations, uh, we want to re reconstruct pedigrees. We want to fill gaps in pedigrees if there are such. We want to look at and assess the level of inbreeding, look at the genetic diversity, uh, but also look at ancestry and origin for, for the individuals and the populations. Um, importantly, for the ex situ, we do want to look at the in situ populations as well. So look at the, the genetic diversity first and foremost, and contrast the level of genetic diversity of the wild populations um, and our populations in, in zoos, so in C2 and, and XC2. Currently, there's been a lot of fantastic progress in terms of uh, sampling and also generating genomic data. So with the help of PKBSI, um, there's been a sampling effort across the Indonesian zoo populations of the three ungulate species where we've uh, sampled all the founder lines of the Anoa, Babarusa, and Banting, and we've generated full genome sequences, so the data is already available and will be looked at very soon. Um, for the XC2 population outside of Indonesia, sampling is at different stages for different uh, species, but uh, there are sampling progress uh, both in IASA and ACEDA for the ungulates, and the tigers are also being um, uh, currently being planned in terms of uh, sampling effort. For the wild, uh, we've actually already generated and analyzed genomic data for the Noah and Barbarossa. And for Banting, uh, sampling is actually already ongoing. So we have a fantastic team uh, in Balran who has led on the training of um, a biopsy dot sampling uh, in four national parks in Java. So together with uh, the other national parks, so in Ujungkulon, Alas Puro, and Mira Batiri, um, there will be staff that are trained in sampling banting, and sampling is actually already progressing quite well. So hopefully by the end of the year, we have all the samples uh, that we need for analyzing the wild populations of banting as well. And that will be fantastic uh, to, to kind of contrast that with the uh, Indonesian superpopulations, but also those um, ex situ populations living outside of Indonesia. Um, but it's, um, I think there are two aspects of this. So we're generating a lot of data that will be analyzed and results will feed in both into conservation actions, but also management recommendations for C2 populations. So what we're doing is actually helping to provide information that will guide uh, management and, and conservation uh, basically for, for these um, species and, and their populations. But it's not, um, it, that's not the only thing here. I think the very crucial aspect is this, that we have a very close collaboration uh, between experts, both in Indonesia and outside of Indonesia. And we will help build capacity in genomic analysis as well in Indonesia. So we're actually looking, um, uh, or we have actually designed a workshop, uh, training workshop to be held in December this year. Uh, for Indonesian scientists and students where we will train um, them in various genomic analysis because they, the students, Indonesian students will help us um, to produce the results that are necessary for the GSMP. So we're looking very much forward to that training workshop. Yeah. That sounds like a, a, a big task, uh, but luckily there's lots of people uh, enthusiastically involved. So thank you, Christina. So once once this information is there, or at least or, or, and already now, um, these populations do of course need to be managed already. Uh, so I want to go over to John, the assistant director of the ACEDA Population Management Center uh, at Lincoln Park, still in the US. Um, so can you tell a little bit more about how zoos manage populations? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you all for coming and good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, my name is John. I, I am a population biologist similar to uh, Dr. Vilsom and um, not quite the genetic expert she is, uh, but how we manage populations in AZA and in many other larger uh, zoo associations is through something we call cooperative uh, population management. Um, a couple of, excuse me, a couple of principles I wanted to kind of state at the beginning. 
are that um, in small population biology, it's kind of its own small field now, um, there are a few standard facts. Um, when you have a small population and it's closed, gene diversity will always decrease and inbreeding will always increase. But the rate at which those occur depends on how well you manage these populations. So all of our populations in zoos, all these XC2 populations started from a wild horse. And so the way we manage is by trying to collect data from zoos who hold particular species that we wanna manage. And we they all cooperate and provide this information to a general stud bookkeeper, which is somebody who has volunteered for this role in their region. Um, and then those data are used to create a pedigree. Um, Dr. Wilson mentioned a pedigree, and that's kind of our baseline tool to figure out where the gene diversity is from all of the historical data that we can find. Um, and then from that, we can do some analysis to figure out baseline gene diversity of a population, how related they are. And then there are a few other goals that we have for cooperative population management broadly speaking. Um, so one thing is we want to make sure we're um, keeping these populations uh, sustainably and long term into the future. Uh, one of the big principles of cooperative population management is that they are all um, considered a potential resource for conservation in the future. They're a resource and a reservoir of genetics for future reintroduction if they're ever needed. Many populations are being used for that purpose now. Some might be needed for that in the future. So our job is to make sure we manage them responsibly so they're available for people to enjoy and learn from in zoos, but also to be used in the future if, if we need them to put them back in the wild. Um, and so to do that, we want to make sure we're keeping these populations demographically stable. We're not producing more animals than we can hold in the zoos that we have, um, but also that what we're producing are genetically diverse similar principle to what we just saw, the more diverse you are, the more resistant you are to disease, um, and also the more gene diversity we conserve, um, the better uh, evolutionary potential we can maintain for eventual releases into the wild. So these animals hopefully will be more prepared and, and armed to go out into the wild and survive if we have to breed for those purposes. And in zoos, we also have a really big um, push to try and make sure every individual animal is being taken care of health-wise and in good welfare situations. For example, if you have um, a very social species and you end up with a zoo who maybe has some older animals pass away and they have a singleton left over, that becomes a priority for us. And then we help managers figure out how to make that animal uh, move or transfer between zoos to be in the best situation it can be. So there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of logistics and cooperation that are needed between zoos and aquariums um, who might hold a species you want to manage. Uh, and then we use the best science and the best data we can uh, to try and keep these animals around. If, if you get the information, let's say from the from the, all the analysis that's been done, how would you how would you use that in your how can you use it in your work? Great question. Yeah. So we. The baseline that we start with is with a database called a stud book. So like I mentioned before, we have many stud book keepers, and this is kind of a repository database um, for a particular species. So Anoa, Babarusa, Bantang, um, Sumatran tigers. And the idea is we want to track as much historical information as we can from this, the start of these populations. And then from that start to the present, um, we have a ped pedigree or family tree, so we know what the parents are of every individual. We know where they came from. We know if they were parent reared or not. We know pretty much as much as we can about them and as much as people will report. Um, historical data might not always be accurate. And so um, sometimes we need help with that, uh, genetically speaking. But from these databases, we can calculate gene diversity. Um, and then cooperatively, we can take the information we get from that and work with zoos to help figure out how to fill needs, how to keep exhibits filled, but also um, how to maybe meet reintroductory requests or needs for different populations. Um, and then we look at what the population size is, how many births we need to maintain that population or grow it. And then we say maybe we need 10 births in the next three years to grow a population to a particular goal. 
And then we would pick particular breeding pairs or individuals to fill those goals. And we do that with the genetics and the stud book pedigrees that we have at hand. Um, and then once we figure out the best breeding that we can make, and we also think about logistics. So if, they're, if zoos are very far apart or closer together, it, we, we try and keep that in mind as well. Better for the animal if they don't have to travel as far. Um, and then once we figure out this logistic puzzle of breeding recommendations and transfer recommendations, um, we provide a plungman to the managers to try and implement. And then of course, because populations always change, we come back in a few years and do it all over again. Yeah, so continued efforts with all kinds of information. Oh yes. Um, yes. Uh, I just wanna remind all the viewers, you know, this is complex information, but if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, like I said at the beginning, uh, or in the Q&A part of this uh, platform, and we'll try to get to them uh, at the end of the webinar. And uh, there are no uh, stupid questions. That's my advice. Uh, um, but thank you, John, for your explanation and linking how you work with uh, genetic information in your work. Uh, I want to move on actually to actually speaker from Indonesia, where all these species are uh, coming from. Um, the Gaia, hi. Uh, you are involved in many aspects of the GSMPs, uh, as well as being the PKBS Sumatran Tiger Stock Bookkeeper. Um, from your perspective, why do you think uh, this approach of global species management plans um, is so important for Indonesian populations? Okay, thank you, Meryl. And then thank you also for this opportunity. So yeah, as Indonesian, for me, uh, the species are very important. So because some of them, they are endemic here, like Anoa, uh, Babirusa, and then Sumatran tiger, Anteng as well. So like what we heard from John and also from Christine, uh, a lot of things that we have to uh, do to keep the animals still exist in, in this world, especially in Indonesia. So we can be assured that uh, it won't go extinct. See, that's what we hope. So for sure with this program that we got the opportunity to join uh, GSMP uh, by uh, James that we came. See, that's why if you see, I have so many tasks that James gave me <laughs> uh, because I started earlier, but now I have so many friends, maybe later on, most of them can just help this as well. But the thing is, yes, this is very important for us. And then we also learn how to do it correctly. <laughs> and then, right, like all the stuff that also we've been, uh, we heard that we need uh, a good data. We need a good also, uh, what do you call that? Uh, a good uh, lab work for the gen genetics. So a lot of questions that we don't know that we can answer. Yeah, for example, for me, I mean, like I collect the data, but all the 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 information that we work for the breeding actually based on the stud book. But it will be interesting to know if we have the genetic uh, profile as well. So we can really tell that they're good or what uh, recommendation that's better that we can do if only using stock book data. So that's why I think that GSMP is willing to work with this, I mean, hard, <laughs> so uh, we can also help the species. So that's what uh, we try to do. And then for this program, actually, with all the recommendation and assistance from uh, GSMP, we work, we try to work we 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 work together and try to uh, uh, work with program that already uh, set yeah in the master plan. So yeah, luckily for these seven years, even though it's not that easy to work with that, uh, but some uh, what some good yield also come. Like for especially we start with the uh, breeding recommendation. And then, yeah, for sure, thank you for all also the, the, the assistance and help from the population biologies from uh, Europe and also America. So 
for us, we learn also about that thing. And then now, I mean, like the data that I got that some individuals, new individuals born, you know, from ANOA, like 11 ANOA, and then for the uh, Banteng, 29 uh, individual, and then Babirusa, 11, then uh, also uh, Sumatran Tigers, 18. So actually we got uh, some result out of this program. So we still hope for the best for next time we can uh, manage better and then we can also fulfill the 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 what uh the recommendation that actually we got from the population biologists how to keep the animal with the the good uh, gene diversity for quite a long time and then also waiting for christina <laughs> result and then we learn something again about that then hopefully that i i, yeah, I know that Beside of the genetic uh, working uh, training later on, we also will have another training even for, for the data collection. I mean, like for stat book, population management. So we have the same uh, knowledge also with, with our friend outside of Indonesia. See, that's what we hope. I think that's what I can tell you, Meryl and everybody else. <laughs> Thank you, Nagaya. Yeah, it's great to see uh, that there's uh, you know, it's it's like you said, it's been a couple of years, but there is results. So um, even though sometimes you may yeah. think it's going slow, it's times. actually going <laughs> quite quite well. Um, and and we were we we're talking about the management of genetic uh, material, basically. But that's also there's also a practical side to it. So I want to turn to Amy, who is the uh, 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 co-leader of the husbandry and training working group, right? And also the EASA uh, Bent Banteng Stud Bookkeeper. Um, how does this all relate to husbandry and breeding in practice? Can you tell something about that? Thanks, Meryl. And yeah, hello and welcome, everybody. Um, so, yeah, as we've heard, um, genetics is a really important part of managing healthy tissue populations. but matching the animals often is just the very beginning when it comes to successful breeding outcomes. So in order to facilitate both breeding and transfer recommendations, good husbandry practices really are key. Um, understanding the animals, understanding their natural history, and even sometimes understanding their individual personalities could be really important. Animals in zoos are reliant on the keeping staff um, to provide them with correct environments, appropriate diets, and the right conditions in order to keep them healthy and happy and to give them the best chance of breeding success. So luckily, um, there's a long history of the GSMP species in zoos globally. Uh, so we have a wealth of knowledge and experience that we can draw upon from across, across the globe and hoping to collaborate, um, share and collate this knowledge is a big part of what the husbandry training working group do. So it allows us to provide support to zoos that may have never transferred an animal before and have a breeding recommendation to do so. Um, and also just help improve the success of breeding in those institutions that are attempting. Uh, sometimes you find that small changes in husbandry practices can really have a big impact on breeding success. So relating it directly to husbandry and breeding transfer recommendations, um, say for example, a zoo receives a recommendation to bring a new male bantang in to breed with females that are currently at their facility. Um, there's going to be a number of things that this institution needs to consider um, before it happens. So logistically, how are they going to move this animal? How will it be transported? Are there things from a husbandry perspective that the keepers can do to minimise the stress for this animal during the move? such as crate training, um, and do the institutions have this experience and the skill set already, or are they going to be wanting to ask for support and help from other places to help achieve it? Um, there's going to be the need to prepare the exhibit. Um, for example, is there enough space already? Are they going to need to expand? Are there enough shelters, feeding stations? Do you have the correct diet in place um, for a breeding situation? Um, so all these things will need to be planned and put into place before that animal is due to arrive. Um, finally, 
when we're looking at breeding specifically, um, we need to make sure that we are meeting that animal's needs and its requirements in order to enable it to have the best chance of breeding successfully. So as we know, different species have different needs. Um, some may need to be kept together full time. Some males may just be introduced to the female when she's in estrus. So then keepers understanding the signs of estrus then also becomes an important husbandry aspect so that they know when to facilitate these mixes. Um, also signs of pregnancy, knowing periods of gestation, um, so that they can understand when the birth is going to happen and be fully prepared for it is really important as well. Um, so yeah, I could go on um, with the list of things um, from a husbandry, husbandry perspective that, that we need to consider. Um, but as you can tell, it is, is a really important aspect. And hopefully all this hard work um, leads to successful births um, from the good genetic pairing and it will achieve their GSMP's goal of increasing healthy exit sheep populations. All right, thank you. Okay, so it's, uh, there's some very practical things to think about for a successful genetic pairing, I would say. Um, um, so as mentioned before, it's, it's, it's quite complex information, or you can consider this complex information, uh, how to deal with uh, genetic diversity, how to manage two populations, uh, within this context of the GSMPs. So, um, and how do you explain this to people, uh, like for instance, in this type of webinar, but also other uh, audiences. So I wanna go to uh, Julia Klum, who is the graphics manager at Zoo Miami in the US. And she's a member of the education group of Action Indonesia team. Um, so Julia, how do you translate and explain the complex information of these programs or the setup of these programs and things like genetic diversity uh, to, for instance, uh, our zoo visitors. Thank you, Meryl. Um, I work on the education working group and the education's working group's job really is to take all of this information and make it accessible to a global audience. So we work with all of the other working groups to build awareness campaigns, but also education campaigns around the species, but also now around genetic diversity, which is our plan for 2023. Um, so my job is I run the social media and the website for the education working group. And what we've been doing with the campaigns group and our social media group, as well as the larger education working group, is taking all of this information about genetics and making it accessible, interpreting it in a way that it will be more accessible to global audiences. So genetics, we've heard throughout this entire webinar, is very complex. Um, not only the genetic makeup of how you come to the DNA and how you create all of these uh, genetic maps and data, uh, but then how you use that within a zoo to create successful populations. And so what we do with that is we take all of that information, we break it up into little bits and pieces. Um, so the best way to explain that is to we break up each one of the parts and then build a larger story over time. So you have to understand what genetics is in general, right? And then what DNA is in order to understand how it plays a role in conservation. So that's our first thing is break up what is genetics? What is DNA? How could we possibly use it for conservation? And then you have to understand why species need diverse populations in managed populations, but then also in, in, in C2 populations in the wild and how that can impact their survival on a longer, larger term. And then, we can explain how Action Indonesia works with genetics to help those wild populations. Another way that we have talked about doing this, because one of the ways that we have talked about is creating a story. Um, people understand things when you can talk about them in sequence. And so one of the ways that we've talked about is a quote unquote love story where we go through from start to finish with stud bookkeepers maintaining records of animals under human care, and then help how they use the genetic information to help them make a breeding recommendation for that animal. And then we can follow the story of that animal with a transfer possibly into another zoo um, and tell the full story of our Action Indonesia species through the whole process to really illustrate how it works in real life. Um, and hopefully 
this will result in a baby, which is, as we know, the most favorite thing for audiences is cute babies. And so we can be able to tell them in a way that is fully accessible to a global audience, how we use each step of the process to result in a successful breeding and transfer plan um, over time through our social media channels and on our website. I have to unmute myself, of course. Uh, so thank you. So, and uh, can you tell us how other zoos can get involved with GSMPs and peace and support the conservation of the species? Yes. So Action Indonesia Day is coming up Sunday, August 13th. And it's a great opportunity, not only for zoos, but for individuals, for your friends and family to get involved in Action Indonesia and raising awareness for all four of our amazing Action Indonesia species. So our website, actionindonesiagsmp.org, has resources in both English and in Bahasa Indonesian. And you can download all of these resources completely free. Um, to build your own awareness campaign and to raise awareness for the species. You can even fundraise through our Just Giving campaign. Um, our Action Indonesia Day activities, we have, a, we have a packet available that you can download, which has banners, it has signage, activities, it has games that are all free, and you can use at your institution or um, in your backyard and with your friends and family. Um, and we're adding more information about genetic diversity into these activities every day. So I'm actually going to share my screen now so that you can see the website and how to navigate to these. So this is our Action Indonesia website. And as you can see, we have all of the information on our species. And this is Action Indonesia Day right here. But when you click on the resources tab right here, it takes you to a page which has all of our resources. But up here at the top, you can click our social media toolkit, which takes you to our Google Drive, which has everything that you could possibly need to create an awareness campaign, specifically for Action Indonesia species. We have banners, photo opportunities that you can download and print out for your own institution, stickers, on-site activities, and all of our logos are available on the website. All of this is completely free to download. Um, and it should be very accessible to everyone. So that website is actionindonesiagsmp.org. And then one of the other things that we are doing as well is in the US, AZA has a program called SAFE, Saving Animals from Extinction. And it's come to the forefront of conservation activities um, within, the UA, within the US in terms of initiatives that um, a lot of AZA zoos are really um, pushing for. So we're in the process of writing a safe application for all three of the ungulate species for the Action Indonesia GSMP. And hopefully we'll allow for a larger participation and involvement from US zoos and we'll only build our conservation reach in the US as well. That sounds great. Yes, for, for all uh, zoos that are viewing this, you know, go to go to the website uh, and find those resources because it's it's a uh, Really well done, and uh, it's a wealth of information and uh, and design for free. So uh, it's very good, good stuff. Um, so thank you, Yulia, and uh, uh, thank you for for uh, all the panelists so far. Uh, we've given uh, uh, a good but quick overview uh, of the various aspects of conserving genetic diversity within the populations of the these awesome species. Um, and I, I mentioned that the audience can give uh, or can ask some questions to our panelists today. And uh, I think I saw, yes, I did see some questions. So uh, these are for all panelists. Um, I haven't seen them yet, the questions itself, so I'm not sure for whom they are yet. Um, one question was, how can the genetic data that we are collecting, uh, help the animals in the wild? Who can, who can jump on that? Is that something for Christina or John or James? Hi, Christina. <laughs> so should I take it, John, or, or do you wanna? Yeah, okay. So 
basically, um, how the genetic data can help uh, the populations in the wild. Well, if, if we, for instance, take um, Banting as an example. So we have Banting populations in, in four national parks in Java, um, and they're isolated from each other. So there are small close populations. Um, so what we're doing here is that we will assess the uh, genetic diversity of these and also inbreeding and other relevant uh, metrics for the full populations. And based on that information, uh, we wanna evaluate whether we would, um, for instance, go in and do meta population management. So basically optimizing where we can in terms of genetic diversity. So allowing the, the closed small populations uh, to mix. So transfer of individuals between the, the isolated populations to introduce more genetic diversity in each of these populations. So that's an example. Yes, thank you. Um, I have another question, um, and this is regarding the collaboration and the cooperation. Um, the question is, is it normal for global regions to work together uh, on zoo populations or other species? That's a good question. I know the answer. Yes, I, I, can, I can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is becoming more and more normal, uh, and it's the need for that is also rising. Um, so you know, as we said, small populations are always getting more related over time, uh, and so we sometimes see the need to go and look at other institutions or other regions to see about um, potentially exchanging animals, and it's usually mutual mutually beneficial. Um, and so uh, an example outside of the GSMPs that have been doing a lot of this have been cheetahs. And so we are building a pretty robust global population for that group. Um, and I think over the past three years, we've done about four or five uh, international exchanges with as many different zoo regions. Um, and so that kind of model is what we're looking to kind of implement with the, uh, the GSMPs as well, so that we can um, make sure that all of our XC2 populations continue to kind of persist and, and be healthy and available for those, uh, those reintroductions and conservation needs. Um, and there's a lot of different ways this can look. So um, there are some populations that might just be bi-regional. There are some that are truly global and have every possible AZA association. So it really depends on um, how the network of individuals who are managing different species are connected. Uh, and if you can kind of connect to the people who are managing what you're managing, um, you can probably do more and more, so. Thank you. And I think connected to that, there's a question in the chat saying, uh, is there a connection between the GSP, GSMPs and the SSP or for Europe, for instance, the European program? Some, somewhat, yes. Yeah. So, um, all of our SSPs that um, are connected to the GSP. So we do have a Babarosa. Um, so an SSP is also a species survival plan. Um, and similar to the EEP is in Yaza, uh, these are just kind of what we call the, the cooperative structure that we use to manage uh, different XC2 populations in zoos. Um, and so our SSP, similar to the IAZA programs, work in cooperation with the GSMP. So we kind of share what recommendations we make to keep our regional populations going. Um, and then we also will take, you know, information from the GSMPs if we need to think about exchanges or help provide sampling for Christina's work and the genetics um, or help with maybe husbandry help uh, and expertise in lending that to the GSMP. So we pull from those regional programs to help the different working groups quite a bit. Um, and just for a broader context too, an SSP is kind of like a GSMP, just regionally focused um, and not as often in that one plan approach vein, just mostly focused on XC2 zoo populations. Yes, thank you. And then I have, a, I think a question for maybe one of our stud bookkeepers in the room. Uh, it's a question about the what data is in the stuckbook database uh, and can people access that or maybe who can access that it's maybe amy or the gaia want to respond to that as stuckbook keepers 
Yeah, I'm happy to give a quick overview and then the guy can add anything that I may have missed. So basically, um, the information is, as John said, a bit of a family tree of all the um, animals that are currently in the stub book. Um, each individual animal will have information on its parentage, of its um, sex, um, whether it's had any offspring of its own, um, whether or not it's contraceptive. Um, so everything that is relevant to that individual will, will be recorded in the stub book. Um, as far as access goes, it's usually the stub book holder and anyone that's assisting the stub book holder. Um, that will have access along with the regional associations and in our case population um, biologists that are involved in the GSMP will have access to the, the GSMP species um, information. Uh, we can grant information or grant access to information to individuals that have requested it for say maybe research purposes or if you are bringing someone on to help you with your stub book you can also grant access to specific information whether that be view only access or whether it be editing rights or you know the ability to download that information but yeah that all goes through the stub bookkeeper um, and the associations to, to provide that access um and i'll just add that in 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 i think many regions um they'll go through a publication process where they have kind of like a paper printout of it um, and they'll update everything for that particular day. So that is um, a, a hard copy that can be more readily available to public viewing for those types of requests. Um, but again, most of the time you just go to the experts like Amy and say, may I look at the data? And then they'll, they'll work with you. Anything you want to add, Ligaya? Or you think uh -huh. they have covered them? Yeah, I think they cover them because we learned from them actually. I mean, like in Indonesia, uh, still the same, but. The thing is for us, uh, more, a lot of the information we have, we need to do also reporting to the government. So that's the important for us that with the start book uh, data, so the government also know what, what's going on with those species, ex situ for sure. So, but the rest are the same. Yeah, thank you very much. And then I have one more question, which is a, a little bit about Action Indonesia Day, actually, um, uh, which is 13th of August. So plug it again. Um, someone asked, uh, we don't have any of the four species uh, in our zoo. Can we still get involved in Action Indonesia Day? Absolutely. Um, Action Indonesia Day, really, I mean, we focus on our four Action Indonesia species, but we've had a lot of zoos in Indonesia, in the US, in the UK that don't have the species and that are using Action Indonesia Day to really raise awareness for Indonesian species in general. Uh, we've had a lot of zoos in Indonesia that have used this as kind of a flagship campaign for a lot of other Action Indonesia species or other species from Indonesia that they have within their collections. And it's a great way just to raise awareness for a GSMP in general, what a GSMP is, what a glo global species management plan does, um, and how amazing these four species are, uh, even if you don't have them in your collection. Yeah, so no reason to not get involved, I would say. Um, I have... Uh, one more question. Um, how do we register our animals in these programs? I'm not 100% sure what register mean, but I guess uh, who decides which animals are in part, make, are part of that program, either one of these Gs and Ps. Is there a way that that's decided? Or is, are all animals automatically part of it? There's two sides to it. There's the genetic angle to this, but also general coll collaboration angle to this. Anybody want to respond? I see in addition to the program, genetically. How do we register our animals genetically in the program? So I, th I think yeah. when, when you think about data and the stud books, we are always happy to record animals in the stud book. Um, 
the more data, the better. It improves any, everything we do. Uh, and the more accurate that data is, the better. But not everybody who maybe wants to submit data, you know, is in a region maybe that wants to participate, um, but maybe your institution is one that wants to participate. I think those are just conversations you have to start with a convener or one of the leaders and then um, kind of go from there and see like, what do you need? What can you give? Um, how do you want to participate? And then we can kind of start those conversations. I don't think there's a one set way. If you want to get your animals into a stud book, Stubbook Keeper is your gateway. Um, all you have to do is reach out and start that conversation, and they'll tell you what you need. Yes, thank you. I think that covers the question. Uh, looking at the time, I think that was the last question that we can uh, deal with. Um, so we're coming to the end of this webinar. Um, before we, I, before I move to the, the closing, just want to remind everybody, also people that have joined later on, that this uh, session is recorded and made available afterwards. So if you've missed something, want to rewatch we rewatch it. That's possible, um, uh, and it will also have subtitles in uh, in Bahasa. So uh, in case you follow that better, then that's that's available. I think in about one or two weeks uh, you can find that probably on the Facebook page uh, of Action Indonesia. Yes, or, we'll have it on the yes. Facebook page as well as on the website. So there's two ways to find it. Um, so that leads me to thanking all our speakers today. Thank you very much for your time, for the preparation uh, and all your work, of course. Um, it's great to hear from all of you and uh, about the work that you are doing to con contribute to the conservation of these species. Uh, and I hope the viewers have enjoyed hearing about this work uh, and have learned something uh, and gotten to know the action in the Niger TSMP a little bit better. Um, I'm going to repeat it again. Action in the Niger Day, 13th of August. Uh, join in uh, and, and celebrate and help spread the word about this, these wonderful species and the programs. And um, I think there will be, yes, there will be a some information shared. So the website's on there and an email address in case you have some specific questions. And uh, I think with that, thank you again and have a great rest of your day wherever you are. <laughs>